Thank you. 
Hi, we're the Junction Trio. Uh, my name is Jay Campbell. This is Stefan Jakiv. This is Conrad Tao on piano. We are about to present to you in your living room uh, John Zorn's Ghosts, a piano trio from 2016. And it is full of a lot of interesting sound, things inside the piano, um, all kinds of spookiness and horrifying psychological pain and nostalgia and glorious chords arising from cracks in the earth. And I hope you enjoy it.
Well, um, we originally were the Junction Trio with Junction abbreviated as JCT. Like when you're driving along and it junctions with another highway, it says like Junction, you know, JCT Highway. And JCT came from Jaquive Campbell Tau. But no one knew what to do with, this, with the abbreviation of JCT, so we scrapped that after two years of no concerts. <laughs> <laughs> no one willing to book us with that name. And now we're the Junction Trio. Yes. I mean, I think as a trio, the three of us are very passionate about playing uh, music by living composers. Uh, this tradition of music is not going to keep living unless keep, music keeps on being written. So I think for me personally, the most important work that I can do is collaborate with living composers. So I've worked with Zorn. This is a relatively new piece, I think, in 2017. Um, and I think there are qualities of it that speak to the type of internal um, pained nostalgia that you hear in Schumann's music. And I think they are presented in very different ways, but they speak to a similar type of very deep and varied and um, kind of cavernous psyche that's capable of a lot of, um, a huge variety of emotions. So for me, that's the connection there, um, kind of two faces of a coin of um, a kind of psychically disturbed uh, nostalgia and, and pained yearning. Yeah. Um, I also think, you know, th that when, when we think of Schumann, I think he possibly more than for me and more than any other, other composer embodies, his music embodies this idea of fantasy. Um, and, you know, right at the beginning of the trio, you hear sort of like the, the piano sort of roiling around in it times almost kind of like sub subliminally suggesting the melody that the violin carries. I like kind of, it, it sort of peeks out now and then, and this sort of idea of some sort of familiar melody or some sort of, um, yeah, melodic figure that you can sort of just see it or hear at the edges of the sound, I think is something you also encounter in the Zorn. Um, obviously, the Zorn is entitled Ghosts, so it's inspired by the slow movement from Beethoven's Ghost Trio. And it begins with a quotation from that trio, the first, I guess, three bars. Da, da, da. Exactly. Actually, let's, Jay, can we just play the, those first three bars? It goes... <laughs> of, the, of, the, <laughs> of the Beethoven. quotation of the Beethoven, but in such a shadowy way and kind of woven into just the kind of the, the pockets of the music that I think it was the Schumann shares that sort of kind of subliminal subliminal messaging. Yeah, I mean, and also the pieces just formally share a multi-dimensional way of communicating. Uh, the Schumann, I, I think one of the reasons why the Schumann is as meaty a piece as it is, is that it's constantly, there's so much happening like in, at the vertical level across the entire work. It's unfolding on it, kind of in on itself all the time and uh, patterns emerge constantly and contract and, um, and expand. And so there's just this constant feeling, as Stefan was saying, this feeling of multiple things happening all the time. And, and so even though they're centuries apart and so some of their formal laws are rather different, I think that the sort of poetry of like pointing in multiple directions and the sensation of multiple things happening at the same time is, is actually quite shared between the pieces. You know, one thing that I just thought of um, in terms of a similar challenge that the two pieces pose is in Schumann, in this piece, and I think really in, in pretty much every piece that I can think of in which Schumann combines some sort of string formation with piano, whether it's a violin sonata or a pian piano quintet, there's a lot of doubling between the piano and the strings. And that's a very particular timbre, you know, a string instrument playing a pitch and it being doubled by the piano at, in the, at the exact same octave. So it kind of creates this 
bell-like resonance, but also sort of like a slight hollowness to the sound. And I think in Schumann, when we're trying to create sort of like this roiling, dream-like, fantasy-like, fever dream-like timbre, that sort of um, bell-like clarity and repetition can be challenging to sort of turn into that texture because it can sound a little bit blocky and kind of rigid. And in the Zorn, there's also a lot of doubling at pitch right at the beginning mm -hmm. um, in, in the plucked piano and um, in the cello and at other points. So the kind of moments of clarity, but also we have to sort of find a way to sort of create a haziness around that clarity, which I think is similar to what we go for in the Schumann. For me, that's the biggest appeal about playing in this trio is that we actually do very little talking um, in rehearsal. We do a lot of playing. Um, I feel it's very clear what the intentions of um, everyone in the ensemble is. Um, and I think there's, there's, I mean, there's one, there's, there's shared aesthetics, I think, right off the bat. That was very clear once we played together. I think that's kind of the first thing that you're looking for um, right away, kind of shared values in terms of just you know, musical things like phrasing and timing and things like that. Um, but also, I think a lot of musicians have been in the position where it can be like pulling teeth to, to work with other people and to, to offer um, not even criticism, but uh, other ways of thinking about what you're doing. And I think being in a space of kind of shared respect for each other um, is the most important thing, I think, when you're making music, because then you actually trust each other on stage. So, I mean, often I think about chamber music um, kind of at its best is like such a great model for um, kind of a, a, like what a better <laughs> society could look like in a lot of ways. Kind of having this shared space where you respect each other, you share ideas, you're working towards a common goal, um, you're supporting each other, it's a group effort, but everyone is totally unique. Um, those are kind of all the qualities that I value the most, and those are all qualities that I find in the trio. So um, for me, I think that's, if you just can check all the box, I'm, you know, I'm gonna dig my nails and not let go. The Junction Trio is a utopian community. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. For me, definitely, uh, I'm just grateful that I have um, contexts around in which I get to play with other people right now. Because like, uh, you know, concerto gigs, which have been a big part of my musical life for the last few years, obviously like really aren't happening at the moment. And so like um, playing with other people in the same room feels like such a like luxury. I mean, I almost don't want to use that word because it's a necessity actually, but, <laughs> but it feels more like, uh, yeah, you just want to hold on to it. And for me, beyond um, even just performing with people in the room, uh, which is of course like amazing, but uh, for me the amazing thing has been getting a chance to rehearse with the group again. Like once we f started rehearsing again um, after like our lengthy periods of, of quarantining, it was just like this is the meat of it. This is like where all the fun, great, st it's where I was reminded of like all the beautiful stuff about playing with these two. Like all of the trust, all of the like enthusiastic conversation about like what something could be, um, you know, it's, and there's like no ego in the room. So it's so like, that's rare. I, you, we all know that's rare, so. I mean, I, I very much feel that in rehearsals. I feel like we're all just trying to arrive at some sort of shared, shared hearing of the piece um, that we think kind of makes sense and does the piece justice and kind of takes into account what each of our ideas are and sort of combines them into a way that, that, that we can all sort of feel moved by. Yeah, um, we respect each other's ears. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's another thing that I love about the trio too is that it's one of the more spontaneous groups that I've ever played in. Um, you know, any, any, diff any given concert on tours during normal times, you know, we play pieces totally differently um, from one night to the next. Um, and I love that. But it, this all reminds me of something that um, is kind of John Zorn's ethos, um, is that music for him isn't really about, ultimately not really about anything else other than people. So when you're writing for people, you're writing for those people. When you're playing with people, it's a completely unique thing that can't be, it can't be replicated. 
Um, and I, re I really like that idea um, and that way of thinking about music as a, as a way of, um, as kind of a mode of sociality. So. Well, you know, I think um, in times happy and sad, easy and difficult, I don't know if there are ever easy times, but there are certainly times that are more difficult than others, um, music sort of like makes us feel less alone because first of all, we listen to music that resonates with things we're feeling and we realize that other people are feeling the same thing. We hear and watch performers who are able to articulate through their music emotions and thoughts that we feel listening in a concert hall or listening at home. And I think, you know, with all the isolation and fear and loneliness that has come with the pandemic and the ensuing quarantine, um, these sorts of avenues for, for belonging and some sort of connection with people are more necessary than ever and more valuable than ever. So I think, A, that's a really wonderful thing to, that, that the Violin Channel is making happen. Um, another thing that um, I, I did a live stream performance um, from home recently and somebody asked um, what uh, listeners could do, what consumers of music could do to sort of help musicians who are, who, you know, who are trying to keep, keep music alive during COVID. And it occurred to me that, you know, musicians, I think, are becoming increasingly creative in the ways in which they're sending out their music into people's living rooms, right? It's not necessarily just filming a concert experience and then just trying to replicate it and, and then beaming it into people's homes. Like, look at this setup. I've never seen a live concert with a backdrop like this that changes every piece. I mean, it's, it's so clearly tailored to, I think, consuming the music in this current special time. And I think what people can do is, while musicians are being adventurous in how they present the music, Music lovers can be adventurous in how they consume the music. So to be more open-minded, not to just sort of say, well, I want a concert experience as close as it was pre-COVID. Hey, this is just a new situation. It's, there are bad sides to it, but there are also good sides. You know, there is some great innovation and new visions that are being realized because of the circumstances. Let me be adventurous in how I how I hear the Schumann trio for the first time. Well, and also like if we're not playing for, it's, I think it's actually really quite essential. And f my experience in doing various live stream shows or shows from home, just finding new ways of getting stuff out and sharing music with people. My experience has been like weirdly affirming that uh, of like what the substance of a concert experience is, which is really just like the kind of, again, the people, the agreement to show up and listen and be there. Um, because I think one of the hardest things about not playing for live audiences in the same space is that like, um, we as performers don't get to feel the active process of an audience listening because it is an active process. Listening is an action. And, and so letting, letting that go has been quite challenging. It's, it's really quite difficult to do. But I have also found it kind of uniquely interesting to have to think through that, to, to have to push myself to, uh, to force myself to let go of the desire for that confirmation that people are listening and in a way It's a different kind of trust. You're you're just putting it out there and you're trusting that people are listening um, And it works it works But within that is just the need and the hope that on the other side is just as much active participation, you know music making whether listening or playing is a participatory experience. And so that's, that's what I've been thinking about. You know, it's, it's funny, pre-COVID, a, a question that was mulled over by probably every single classical music presenter was, what can we do to make the concert going experience <laughs> less formal and less stiff? And there were all kinds of solutions, some better than others. You know, let's let people drink beer during the concert. Let's <laughs> right. encourage them to live tweet the event, note by note. <laughs> and then COVID happened, and then it was just like the ultimate solution. We are bringing live music into people's living rooms and bedrooms. 
Like, how much less formal does it get than that? Like, people are literally in their pajamas, sipping wine, and like listening to John Zorn's music. And it's almost as if like all those little things about, oh, let's live tweet it, let's, you know, give them, you know, bagels at intermission or whatever, all of that was just taken to like the nth degree. <laughs> and now people are at their most unguarded, I think. I mean, I'm certainly at my most unguarded when I'm at home, you know. You can Listen have a you can have a sacred listening experience anywhere, anywhere, yeah. wearing anything yeah. and in yeah. any yes. <laughs>